My wife, as many of you know, may be one of the world's most perfect eaters, which is a blessing in many ways. And sometimes, I'll be honest, it feels a little bit like a burden. And for a number of years, she'd been trying to get me to go on what they call an elimination diet. It's where you get these blood tests and they kind of tell you what foods you may be not acting with very well. And you withhold these foods for three weeks. You can't eat any of them. And then you reintroduce them and see how it goes. Well, the problem with someone like me going on an elimination diet is it means there's absolutely nothing I like that I can eat. I mean, I just, what, what I enjoy, nothing was on the list of what's left over supposedly good for me. And then in, in a case of abominable timing, I did it last year over my birthday. And the reason that's significant, there's one thing I really look forward to on my birthday. I really don't get a lot of presents at this stage in my life. But I get to eat cake and ice cream. I love Cake and ice cream. I got to tell you, in, in my life, the priorities at this age, it's God, family, cake and ice cream, and you all. Right, right about <laughs> where I go. But because of the calories and the fat, I just can't do it that often. So on Father's Day and my birthday, I tend to treat myself to cake and ice cream. So I'm doing this over my birthday, and somebody had had us over to their house, and they cooked this great, baked this great cake that had bluebell ice cream. I had to watch five other people eat my cake and ice cream, sitting there, right, chewing on a carrot. I mean, it's just, I, that night, I'm telling Lisa, you have no, when this is over, you have no idea how I'm going to splurge. I'm going to so enjoy myself. And Lisa's like, you can't do that. I said, what do, what do you mean? She goes, it takes weeks, if not months, to come off an elimination diet. Said, what, what are you talking about? Nobody told me that. She goes, Gary, you introduce foods one by one, and, and you see how it happens. I go, Explain this to me. And she goes, well, for instance, you tested for cranberries. So we'll give you a few cranberries on the first day. Wait a couple days and see how, it handle, how your body handles it. I don't even like cranberries, all right? I, I eat cranberries on Thanksgiving to be polite. If I went the rest of my life without eating another cranberry, I would not be a poor man. I was like, honey, what doctor from hell thought up this diet? But here's the thinking. There are certain foods, maybe they're giving you headaches, maybe they're making you lethargic, maybe they're giving you a foggy mind, and, and you may not realize it, and you've got to remove these foods. If you want a flourishing life, if you want the most energy and, and mental clarity, you've got to get rid of what they call these toxic foods. What if the same thing is true for relationships? What if there are people in your life that are making you sick, relationally, spiritually, emotionally. They're making it hard for you to have clarity. They're making it hard for you to have self-confidence. But, but maybe out of misplaced guilt, perhaps out of a weak sense of mission, we'll get to that. You're allowing these people to remain in your life. And you're making excuses. Well, it's my parents. It's a child. It's, it's a co-worker. It's a sibling. They've been a, a long friend. And you keep interacting with them even though you know they're making you sick. Keeping you back from healthy relationships. Keeping you from doing the ministry that you know God has called you to do. Because you think that's what God is calling you to do. And the question is, what if he's not? What if God wants you here this morning to free you up from that faulty thinking? I believe if we're going to handle the toxic relationships in our life, we need a new Mind change. Romans 12, 2 says, be transformed by the renewing of your minds. I have smart people here in Houston. We got that down. Be transformed by the renewing of your minds. So we just have to think differently. And this goes back to how we define our faith. And here is the mind change I'm talking about this morning. Why it's important that we handle toxic people. Being holy isn't just about not doing sinful things. It's about being set apart for glorious eternal things. For much of my life, I thought holiness was about not doing more things than you don't do, being more disciplined at saying no, and yet holiness is really a life of enthusiastic, sacrificial yes. It's not, saying, it's not just saying no to the sinful things, it's saying yes to the glorious things. And so Jesus presents a life of faithfulness to him as a life of producing good fruits. He said to his workers, or to his disciples, look, pray for the Lord of the harvest to send more workers. Now, why did he say that? He said, this work is more important than any work that will ever be done on this planet, and there are not enough of us. 
We need more to spread the message of God's reconciling everyone to himself. Living for his kingdom instead of our own. He says there's never be enough of us. You got to pray for more, which means all of us who are a part of that work, we need to make every hour, every relationship count. Which is why Jesus then went on to say in John 15, 8, By this is my Father glorified. Not that you don't look at this, don't eat that, don't talk about that. What does he say? That you read those three words with me. Bear much fruit. God is glorified when we bear much fruit. So Jesus is saying fruitfulness matters. One of the great challenges is that we live in a day and age where faithfulness is defined by piety, avoiding evil actions more than it's defined by fruitfulness, doing good works. But if we get Jesus' view of holiness, we see that if somebody is getting in the way of us doing what God's called us to do and being the people God has called us to be, then that person is keeping us from living a holy life. It's not... It is not that we don't want to be bothered. As Christians, we live to be bothered. Those divine appointments, God says, sacrificially serve, sacrificially give. We look for those moments. It's just that we want to be most strategic in those moments to make the best use of every time that God has given us. And this is where I think Satan is hitting the church with one of his most clever traps. And it's this. He knows he can't stop us from caring Because God's spirit makes us care. God pours his love out into our hearts and we want to love others. We want to sacrificially give to others. We want to listen. We want to be those who can help others. Satan knows that and he knows he can't stop it. But here's what he can do. He can, we can look at that love, that pure love of God as pure water flowing out. That if God unleashes it through us, it will go out into fields. It will irrigate these fields and it will produce abundant crops of rich fruit to feed the world. He says, well, I can't stop the water flowing, but I can get the Christians to pour that water straight down the gutter. Instead of going into fertile fields ready to produce fruit, I'm going to put it down to the gutter of toxic people who not only won't receive that love, they'll resent it, they'll find a problem with it, and they'll make the person pouring out that love so regret even thinking of doing it that they won't do it anymore. That's why we have to be careful of toxic people because they often stop the rest of our ministry. But when we realize this, and this is key, that we were saved for a mission then we know we have to address toxic people in our lives. Jesus stresses this in Matthew 6, 33. And I can almost see my wife's eyes rolling right now. She told me one time, Gary, it's possible to preach a sermon without quoting Matthew 6, 33. In theory, I know that's true, but it's really hard for me. It is, because it, it sets everything up. If I'm waking up every day... That this life isn't about my enrichment, my pleasure, my purpose, my comfort. This is about seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. That every day I want to say, Lord, how am I a part of your plan? How am I growing in righteousness? Everything falls into place. And when Jesus said this in the Sermon on the Mount to every believer, I want to stress he is not talking to people who made their living being Christians. He's talking to farmers. He's talking to tradesmen. He's talking to grandparents and parents. He's talking to young people. To be a Christian, he said, is to be someone who wakes up and their first concern is God's kingdom. Their first concern, they want to grow in righteousness. And then when Jesus rose from the dead, he explained how we seek first his kingdom. It's not about worldly accomplishments. It's about people. God's kingdom is built by people. So he says in what we call the Great Commission, Matthew 28, 19, go and make disciples of all nations, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. We're to find people who want to receive God's love, who are willing to obey what God commands. That's what it means to seek first his kingdom. Now, the Apostle Paul, who was mesmerized by Jesus for good reason, he saw Jesus in his glory. He was taken up to the third heaven. He saw things no other human has ever seen, uh, save Jesus himself. And he basically preaches the Sermon on the Mount and the Great Commission in his own words. He preaches the Sermon on the Mount in 2 Corinthians 5, 15, when he says this, Christ died for all, 
so that those who live no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for him. That's his Matthew 6.33. It's not about our salvation. It's not about our happiness. It's not about our evolving empowerment. It's about living for him instead of ourselves. And then his great commission is 2 Timothy 2.2. Hey, Timothy, whatever you've heard me say in the presence of many witnesses... Give that to reliable people. Some translations say faithful people who are qualified to teach others. I'm trying to show, I'm not proof texting here. This is the force of how Jesus described the faith. It's how Paul described the faith. Basically, Jesus and Paul agree the focus of Christianity is not on doing, is, is not avoiding bad things. It's about investing in good, reliable, faithful people. Well, I want you young people to hear that because sometimes you think you've tubed your faith if you do one bad thing and you're starting over. The focus of Christianity is not on avoiding bad things. It's about investing in reliable, faithful people, taking what God has given you and giving it to others. So by extension, that means we don't have time. For the toxic people. We don't have time for the unreliable people. We don't have time for the people who don't want to hear what God wants to say. And we don't have time for the toxic people. I keep using that word. What does it mean? Is it a psychological catchphrase? Here's what I mean by toxic. And this is the challenge of a sermon. It takes me three chapters in the book. When to walk away to define this and distinguish it. So I, but I don't have time to go into it that much. But in general I'll say this. All toxic people are difficult but not all difficult people are toxic. Some people are just difficult because they're annoying. Some are, are hurting. They're wounded. A toxic person is a different kind of person who wants to do you harm. You can't interact with them without being a little bit destroyed. A difficult person, let's say that you, you, you picture what God wants to give to you in the morning to give to the world as a, as a big tray of food. And so you're excited, you come out of this quiet time, you have all this stuff to give out. A difficult person might come and wipe out your tray in one fell swoop. I want it all. You're like, well, that's kind of annoying, but you know, they're a little immature. Put up with that. A toxic person says, that's not enough. Cut off your arm and let me gnaw on that. They want to take a piece out of you until there's not much left of you. That's why when you become a lifeguard, one of the first lessons they teach lifeguards is self-defense. Because when you go out there and somebody's drowning, they may inadvertently drown you. They're panicking. They might pull you down. And so to save others, you have to learn how to defend yourself. Otherwise, you can be drowned in the midst of trying to help others. And this is spiritual lifeguarding, spiritual self-defense, where we have to learn the signs of somebody who is bringing us down. Because if they bring us down, not only do we not help the person bringing us down, we lose the opportunity to help all the other people we might save. On different days. And so toxic people are those, they drain you. They demean you. They make you feel so awful about yourself. You feel like you have nothing to give to others. So you won't speak up. You have no peace to hear the voice of God because you're haunted by their attacks. They're making you sick and weak and unfruitful. If someone is getting in the way of you being the person God created you to be and doing the work that God created you to do, for you, that person is toxic. Andrea faced this her first year of school here in Texas. She chose one roommate, the school assigned a third roommate, and uh, Andrea had never met anyone like this Samantha, who was the school assigned to her. She, she needed a beef with someone just to get out of bed. It was something Andrea had done or not done. Something someone else had done or not done. And then she, it seems like she would deliberately set up conflict. She, she would move Andrea and the other roommates' things. And then when they would say, hey, look, please don't just move our things. She would stomp out, go to the next door neighbor, very thin walls, you know, college dorms. And scream about how awful Andrea and the other roommate were. And Andrea didn't know what to do. She said, she's had more conflict in the first two months of college than I've had in the first two decades of my life. And yet Andrea grew up thinking, you know, you, you prove your Christianity by being able to be nice to everyone. 
Samantha figured that out and she just ran roughshod over Andrea's first few months of college. And she became convinced that Andrea had demons. She says, I've talked to this guy, I go to the church, and, and he agrees with me that you're just filled with demons, but if you'll come home with me this weekend, he said he would deliver you. And I said, you know, that's really not something I feel good about doing. And, she, and, and Samantha, she, what, what kind of sick person doesn't want to be delivered from demons when, when an experienced guy is doing that? And, and the school didn't really know what they were dealing with. You know, this is just kind of a thing where young people need to learn how to get involved. But Andrea's mother saw her. I mean, she began to see this transformation of her daughter in the worst way. Andrea was, was breaking out. She looked listless because she would stay out late, hoping that Samantha would be in bed before she got back, and then get up early. So hopefully she'd be out of the room before Samantha woke up. And it just took her away from other relationships took her away from energy until her mom finally stepped in and said, we have to get Andrea out of there. So once Andrea was gone, the, Samantha turned her attention on the other roommate, and she was gone by Christmas. School assigned another roommate, and she was gone by Easter. Holidays were very unkind, Samantha. But here's the thing. I'm glad that I wasn't the one advising Andrea 20 years ago. I was naive as they come. I, I didn't have toxic people. Many, I thought God just wants us to break through to everyone. We can be the spiritual heroes that can fix those kind of people. And so I might be dealing with somebody, if you use the analogy of a toxic person who's having bad breath, you know, the kind of person who eats garlic, leeks, and onion, and gas station sushi, right? And, and, and they're a close talker, just blowing that all over. And I'd be smelling that. Here's what I would say. God, please heal my nose. There must be something wrong with my nose. I don't want to be rude and think this person's breath stinks. So would you please just heal my nose? I'm probably just being too sensitive. And God would say, no, Gary, there's nothing wrong with your nose. It's telling you that's a toxic breath. That's a toxic person. And I'm giving you spiritual discernment to learn when to walk away. How did I get to this place? Well... God just opened up my eyes through a good friend of mine. I was engaging my own toxic person one time. I didn't understand. I mean, he's lying about me. And then I find out a long-term campaign to undercut me. And, just, and, and I didn't, can't think of anything I'd ever done. Now, don't get me wrong. I, I can think of dozens of reasons why somebody would have a problem with me. I can imagine anybody being annoyed by me. I mean, i got a lot of annoying characteristics. But... But I just thought, why attack me? Like, why lie about me? And so I have this experienced friend. He's been in marriage and family therapy for over 35 years. Knows the scriptures backwards and forwards. I just I, do I confront him? Do I just, how do I handle this? And he shocked me when he said, Gary, my recommendation is don't engage him at all. What do you mean? That would seem like such a failure to me to not even engage him at all. And he said, Gary, go to the book of Luke. Count how many times Jesus walked away or let others walk away from him without him giving chase. A lot of you know me. I'm not clinically OCD, but I live in the neighborhood right next door to it. So when a counselor tells me to go and count that in the book of Luke, I had to go to all four Gospels. And y'all, my eyes were opened up to a reality that blew me away. I mean, this was like sacred marriage. God designed marriage to make us holy more than to make me happy. Blew me away. Changed everything about how I viewed ministry. Because I saw Jesus walking. I counted 41 citations. 41. Where Jesus had an encounter with someone and he let that person walk away without giving chase. Or he chose to walk away himself. Now, they're not all toxic people. But it was still a principle of ministry. And because of the synoptic gospel, some of them refer to the same encounters. But there were still over two dozen occasions where Jesus said, we're done. Now, in my, in my shame and weakness, I would have counted that as a failure on my part. I wasn't surrendered to God. Maybe I'm not walking in obedience. I'm not listening to the Spirit. I can't believe that Jesus ever failed. So I had to realize, well, maybe I just haven't seen this right. And, and it's hard for us to think of Jesus even doing that. I've been doing some blog posts on this, and I had one woman respond to a later blog post. She hadn't read the book. Gary, Jesus didn't walk away. He wouldn't walk away. Because we just don't see it. And I said, um, appendix has 41 times. I mean, he, he did. 
And then Jesus taught his disciples. I mentioned how often I quote Matthew 6.33. I can't believe I never saw this before. When Jesus says Matthew 6.33, he's basically launching the church onto offense. Go, spread God's kingdom. Give your life to seeking first the kingdom of God. Seven verses later. Now it's a separate chapter. It's Matthew 7.6. But it's just seven verses later. We often divide up the Bible. We separate one passage from the other. But if you look at this in context, Jesus sends the church on offense and then almost immediately says to be most effective, you've got to play some defense. Here's what he says in Matthew 7, 6. Don't give what is holy to dogs. Don't throw your pearls before swine or they will trample them under their feet and turn and tear you. To pieces. So he said, I'm going to send you on offense, but watch out for these people. Now, you can't make these verses sound nice. Okay? When Jesus calls people dogs, Jews didn't keep dogs as pets. He's not talking about Lassie or Fluffy or Spot. Romans and Egyptians kept dogs as pets, not Jews. Jesus is talking about those vile Filthy mongrels, the worst of dogs. Still better than cats, but the worst that dogs could be. <laughs> and then when he says, don't throw your pearl before swine, pearls were so valuable. He has a parable about the man who sold all he had for a single pearl. And Jesus said, you could give something like the kingdom of God. You could present it in the most loving, gentle, kind way with the best motives. And the pig hates it. Pig doesn't want, the pig resent, pig can't eat it, pig can't do anything with it. So the pig is angry because you're not doing, giving the pig what the pig wants. And he'll turn and try to tear you to pieces. And Jesus said, I don't want that to happen to you. We have a limited number of workers. I want you to protect yourself. It says that you don't get wiped out by these toxic people that are out there. And so if it sounds awful calling people toxic, I'm just saying in the first century, Jewish culture calling people dogs and pigs... Think about it. That's a little bit worse. And I found that Matthew 7, 6 is sort of like a Rorschach test. You remember that psychologists use them? They give you these ink blots. And then the counselor says, what do you see? And they kind of figure out what you're thinking by what you see in these ink blots. Matthew 7, 6, if you think Christianity is about being nice, Matthew 7, 6 seems cruel. You might even, Jesus couldn't really have said that. But if you believe Christianity is about being fruitful... If you believe Christianity is about seeking first the kingdom of God, that God is most glorified when we bear the most fruit, it's gold. Thank you, Jesus. I want to be the most fruitful. I, this is strategy I need. This is wisdom that I need to live by. It's like battlefield triage. If you read about World War II when they, soldiers stormed Normandy Beach and people were just being mown down by the machine guns and artillery. There's a cadre of surgeons that followed, and they had to do what they called triage. It was in once a terrible work, but a courageous work. They had to make on-the-spot triage decisions. They might come up to a soldier who was almost dead. They might think, if I spend 90 minutes with this soldier, there's a 5% chance I could save his life. If that's the case, they would give him a shot of morphine and walk away. He said, Why? Because to spend 90 minutes on a guy that probably couldn't be saved could make them miss 10 guys that they could save who will bleed out if they don't get to them. It's not that they had a hard heart. They had a strategic heart. We're involved in spiritual warfare. And we're to discern, is God already convicting this person? Is he working in their heart? How do we move forward? Because it's what Jesus did. In spite of this woman says Jesus would never do that. Let me give you just one of the 41 examples. So Matthew chapter 8, Jesus is, delivers two men possessed of demons. The demons say, hey, can we go into the herd of pigs? And Jesus says, yeah, sure, go ahead. Pigs run off a cliff and they all die. The town people are appalled because their livelihood, I mean, their stock market is just... They can have a fire sale on bacon and pork chops, but next week after that, it's slim pickings. And so they come to Jesus, and this is what's so painful to read. Don't, don't miss the passion behind Scripture. Let me ask this. How much would you pay to see Jesus in action for a weekend in the flesh? 
You got to watch him heal people. You got to hear him. You could ask him questions. You could hear the tone of his voice. How long would you wait in line for that ticket? Man, if you're here on a Sunday morning, you might hear me, Ben or Kurt. I bet a long time, right? They had that. Jesus in the flesh. But they're so appalled at the way Jesus has wept, wiped out their industry. They say in Matthew 8, 34, they pleaded with Jesus to leave their region. They pleaded him, just go. And what does Jesus do? Matthew 9, 1, it's the very next verse. It might seem like it's separated in scripture. It's the very next verse. It says that Jesus got into a boat crossed over and came to his own town. He didn't walk away, he sailed away. Same principle. Jesus said, okay, you're not ready to obey all that I've commanded you. You're not a reliable person to teach others. I'm going to find other people that I can invest in. He taught his disciples and he modeled to his disciples the appropriateness of learning when to walk away. Look, when I've been praying for this weekend, I believe there's some people in particular that God wants you to be here and to hear this. Because I believe this is from God's heart straight out. God isn't honored when out of misplaced guilt or a weak sense of mission, you let yourself be emotionally and spiritually and mentally and sometimes even physically ripped to shreds. That doesn't honor God. It's not what he's calling you to do. He wants you to be vibrant he wants you to be self-confident so that you know you have something to give. Not because of who you are, but because of who he is in you. He wants you to have peace so that you feel settled in reaching out to others. He wants you to have joy because those are the kind of people that draw others. Those are the kind of people that produce much fruit. But if toxic people can make you question your sanity because they tend to be masters at gaslighting, they haunt you at night so you can't think about anyone else then you're not going to be fruitful. And when you walk away from these toxic people, I want you to think of it this way, because some of you, I love your tender consciences. I, I, I relate to that. It makes me like you all the more. But here's the thing, what you're doing when you walk away, if that person can't not be toxic to you, they can't not abuse you, when you walk away, you're keeping them from sinning. <laughs> You say, you can't be around me without sinning. That grieves God. I'm going to serve you, and I'm going to serve God by removing a cause of pain from him. I love God too much to let you treat me this way. I'm going to walk away. William Grinnell wrote this doorstopper of a book called Christian and Complete Armor. You got to get on Kindle if you read it. I mean, it's a great book. It's a Puritan book, but it's 1,200 pages. I mean, it's just, just gigantic. But he said... It's easier to keep flies out of your pantry in the summer. Now, this is the 17th century. No air conditioning, no refrigeration. Imagine what it was like trying to store food. It is easier to keep flies out of your pantry in the summer than to keep Satan's servants from stealing your joy and infecting your peace. He said, this is a warfare. And he wrote Ephesians 5. He's talking about spiritual warfare. There is a warfare going on amongst God's people. He can't steal your faith. He can't steal your belief. He can't steal God's love from your heart. But he can send these servants who rob you of your joy. He said, well, Gary, that sounds selfish that I worry about losing my joy. Except... The Bible says the joy of the Lord is my strength. If he can make you weak, he wins. Because you don't produce the fruit that God has called you to produce. There's another group, even praying this morning, that I believe God would want to reach. And this is where I was convicted writing this book as much as anything. The biggest, the most toxic person in your life is you. You brush your teeth of the most toxic person in your life every day. Where I was convicted is when God said to me, I believe, Gary, don't say anything to yourself that you wouldn't say to your wife or kids. You know what? I say things to myself I would never say to my wife. I use tone with myself I would never use with my kids. But if God cherishes you, and he does, and you talk toxic to yourself, so you undercut your joy, you undercut your peace, you feel like you have nothing to give because you talk yourself into this rubble of uselessness, that doesn't please God. 
And it keeps you from bearing good fruit. And the chapter I've heard from so many people is that chapter, don't be toxic to yourself. I don't want to be toxic to others because that grieves God. And I don't want to be toxic to myself because that also grieves God. So it comes down to this. We eliminate the foods that make us sick. Now, some foods, they may not put you in the hospital. They might give you a sinus headache. They might increase your arthritis. They might give you a foggy mind. How sick do you have to let food make you before you start to say, it's not worth it, can't eat it anymore? And some of you have relationships. They're not going to put you in a mental hospital, right? But how sick do you let them make you before you say, you know what, I want to live a fruitful life. I want to live the life of an overcomer. I want to live a flourishing life, excited to serve God. The joy of waking up, I get to seek first his kingdom. And not have this person haunt me so I feel like I have nothing to give. If that's you, put the misplaced guilt aside. To follow in the footsteps of Jesus many times throughout scripture is to learn when to walk away. 